Good evening, Sanibel Community Church. All right, well, let's come on in. Let's find a, uh, find a place to, to sit. And let's be called to worship today with words from Psalm 100. And so like we do each week, we like to open up with God's Word. So let's read these words aloud from Psalm 100, five verses that summon us to worship, focusing our minds and heart. You ready to read? All right. Keith is ready. Verse 1, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and His faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you tonight. It is a joy to be together as your people and an important means of grace, of sustaining grace to us, to feed our hearts and our souls, to push us onward to faithfulness, to come and recite your words together and to remember who you are and what you have done for us. Even later in the service as we take communion, we remember the broken body and shed blood of our Savior. So, Lord, as we enter this Advent season, let's remember that Christmas is here because of Easter. And so, Lord, we want to worship and thank you for sending your Son for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand together.
uh, continue to worship right now through the act of giving. So ushers, why don't you go ahead and come down. Uh, we give not because God is in need of anything, but because it demonstrates that what we have, we are stewards of, right? And so as we continue to worship in song, let's continue to worship in giving.
We're saying it's true. Like the old King James may, see, may say, verily, verily, I say unto you. Literally, it's amen, amen. It's true. Veritas, it's true, right? So when we say something, we say amen. We're saying, like when Jeremy preaches, amen. We're saying it, that's true. And we believe it and affirm it, right? So when we sing that song, we're affirming that God has sent his son for us, right? And so we unite to cry as his people, amen. Father of the 
the sound of saving grace Christ died for me How sweet the sound of saving grace How sweet the sound of saving grace Christ died for me Church, take a few moments and greet one another in the peace of Christ. Hello, hello, good evening, return to your seats, we're going to read the Bible. It always shocks me how far people travel during this time. They spot someone across the sanctuary and beeline. Our, uh, our sermon text today is Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Genesis 48. After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours." They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. 
And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessing, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope, that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Yeah, thank you, Teddy. You're probably aware that Teddy is our first pastoral apprentice, and uh, he's getting an education that you'd never get in seminary (laughs) these last two months, right? And I I do, before we go to prayer, I do want to just brag a little bit Teddy has been preaching out at uh, Sanibel Community Church in room 107, um, has preached three times now and just doing a fantastic job. And so if you see him today before you leave, just encourage him with that. So let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we come before you humbly today in awe, in wonder, in amazement. Father, you are holy. You are love. Lord, that you've most profoundly displayed on the cross through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, you're faithful. We've just seen it over and over and over again. Lord, even in those times where we're not even aware of your faithfulness, Lord, we know it to be true. We're so grateful for that. We thank you that you have just showered your grace on us. Your mercy, Lord, is new every morning. Father, it's hard for us to even fathom just how great you are, but you are awesome, God. Lord, we also admit our own weakness. We know that we are but mere humans, but Father, in your eyes, we know we're special. And Lord, we know that you are the one that not only has preserved us, but continues to sustain us day and day and day, night after night. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you that you carry us along. So, Father, we praise you for that. We worship you for that. Lord, we as a church have come to learn what it really means to be sojourners in this land. We know this has been a hard lesson for us, but, Father, even in it, we've seen Uh, Just beautiful acts of your providence every single day. And we just thank you for that, Lord. We thank you uh, for giving us places to stay, giving us places to meet. Lord, we're so grateful that here Fort Myers Community Church has shown great hospitality to us and just welcomed us in. And, And Lord, we're so grateful we see your hand in that and we thank you for it. Lord, we also know that we need a a home to worship in. Lord, we know that uh, you have called us to continue to spread the gospel and make a name for Jesus uh, throughout this region. So, Father, we just come to you today and we ask, Lord, provide a place for us to worship, a permanent place, Lord, where we can make your your name known, a permanent outpost here in Fort Myers where uh, we can just kind of stake a flag in the ground and say, 
this place belongs to Jesus. And, and so, Father, we ask that, that you would do that for us, provide for us in that way. And, Lord, we, we want to be faithful to you to make your name known uh, through that place. And so, Father, we just ask you would do it. We don't know what the future holds uh, in that regards, but, but, Lord, we would love to be used by you in a great capacity uh, in southwest Florida. And so, Father, we just ask that you would help us in that. Lord, I was thinking about our other little outposts we call homes. And what a strange word to even use right now. So for so many, they're, they're staying in borrowed homes or rented homes or just hoping for the day they can get back in their home. And so, Lord, home has become a very um, significant word right now for all of us. And I was thinking about the homes that we have here that have, have opened up for others to come and share in the word and share in prayer and, and uh, just experience that kind of close community. And so, Father, I thank you right now for all of our community groups that are meeting I just pray, Lord, that these continue to be uh, just rich places and spaces of prayer and digging deep into your word, encouraging one another through application. And Father, I pray that curious neighbors would begin to knock on the doors of our community group homes. And so, Father, I pray that you would use them now um, as a beacon of hope for this area. Lord, also, as I came to church tonight, I saw all the kids out in the, out in the yard playing, and Lord, our hearts um, are reminded of the young families. Lord, we admit it's so hard for us, even as adults, to, to manage and understand and go through a season like this, but Father, we think about our children and how they're perceiving everything that's going on, the lens through which... They're looking at all of this. And Father, we pray right now for our young families. We pray that they continue to be steadfast and faithful, Lord, in your word. I pray for our young families that they would keep the gospel, the very centerpiece, in their home. When they sit down for dinner, Lord, we pray that, that conversations about Jesus would be had. And, and they would pray, Lord, for one another. We pray as they go to bed at night, they would be reminded of how you have carried them along and sustained them. When they wake up in the morning, I pray, Lord, that they would be reminded of the mission and the purpose of their life. So, Father, we thank you right now. Just encourage our young family. Strengthen them, we pray. We just thank you so much, Lord. We thank you again for this time of sweet worship. Lord, prepare our hearts now as we hear your word preached. Lord, we pray that we would have open ears, open eyes to see what you'd have us see today, and that our hearts would be moved, Lord, towards greater faithfulness in you. We just thank you, Lord. Lord, this is all about you. This is all about you. So may you be glorified. May you be honored in everything we do and say today. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Doug. Uh, we invite children here, uh, speaking of children, to Children's Church. They'd like to head through the door up here on the front right of the sanctuary and invite the rest of you again to open your Bibles to that text that Teddy read for us, Genesis chapter 48, Genesis chapter 48, and uh, for those who are here for the first time, my name is Jeremy, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to, to preach God's word to you this evening, Genesis chapter 48. So we continue our study through the life of Joseph and really Jacob. This is about Jacob as much as it is Joseph and, and learning the lessons from uh, his, his time on earth and the things that God's recorded for us in his word. You know, we live in an age of conspiracy theories. Have you ever gotten sucked into a conspiracy theory Someone sent you an email or you clicked on a tantalizing link on some social media thread and the next thing you knew it was an hour later and you were, I can't, maybe this is true. Maybe this is really happening. Um, you know, social, these uh, the conspiracy theories are so interesting because they, they span the, the spectrum of ideological viewpoints. There's, there's some conspiracy theories on the left end of the spectrum 
You know, uh, you know, for instance, uh, well, it's more of an it's academic theory, but it's kind of a conspiracy theory too, is critical theory. You know, the idea behind critical theory is, is that you're analyzing culture to discover the hidden power structures that favor some groups and disfavor and oppress other groups. And, and that they're sort of hidden structures. So if you are a white, male, cisgender, able-bodied Christian, uh, you know, like me, uh, then, then there is a hidden uh, structure that, that favors you in society. That's the conspiracy. So, you know, you get these, these students going off to college who've never felt oppressed a day in their life, and suddenly they come back from college and they see oppression everywhere. Their eyes have been opened to the conspiracy. Or you can go to the right end of the spectrum. And the World Economic Forum is collaborating with the World Health Organization to orchestrate the great reset that will bring about the globalized world for the one world system and the Antichrist and Revelation. And if you heard that one too. And there's always someone behind the scenes, you know. There's always a... Uh, I don't know, white supremacist organization or there's you know, George Soros funding things or somebody is behind the scenes. And it's interesting, just I'm kind of intrigued by conspiracy theories. I, mean, I don't know, I just, it's kind of like a car wreck. Like I just have to like look at it and see why, why it's, what, what is it all about? Um, you know, why are we so intrigued by them? Why are they so popular today? And I mean, part of it's just the internet, right? Because there's so many theories out there and you can read things. I think part of the reason that conspiracy theories have legs today is because we are living in a globalized society where we live, uh, in, where there's interconnected economies, interconnected politics, uh, trade, there's mass media, there's social media. So it is a kind of world where if you could learn how to, or have a group of people who could manipulate some of those levers, you really could have a greater influence today by leverage than you could have, say, like 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And then sometimes it just seems like, gee, I wonder if it's true. I mean, just when you're about to, to discount it, you know, Elon Musk does a big document dump this week. And you're like, oh my goodness, there actually were emails like, maybe it's all true. Maybe it's, you know, and you start freaking out again. Let me ask you this, probably an even more important question. As you have sort of encountered conspiracy theories in your own life, what effect have they had upon your soul? How do they affect your heart, your outlook, and your mind? I'll tell you what it does for me. It makes me pretty hopeless. <laughs> when I start listening to those things, I just start feeling like I'm this powerless little peon who's at the mercy of great machinations of powerful cabals of people. And I just think like, man, maybe the world is just falling apart and there's nothing we can do. And I just feel so kind of hopeless and discouraged well, I want to encourage us all from Genesis chapter 48 tonight by reminding us that the Bible is all about a conspiracy, a divine conspiracy, that God has a comprehensive global plan, that God has his own critical theory that is very critical of the world and that sees that the world is lost in sin, all people, and that God has his own great reset planned where he plans to bring about his kingdom. But the thing about God's plans and God's conspiracy is not only will they prevail, but God is going about his purposes in a very surprising way. That it's not the way that the world is going about its power moves and plans. That the world is using you know, raw power to accomplish its purposes. But God specializes in bringing his great, glorious kingdom through weakness, through powerlessness, through lack of status, that God says the meek shall inherit the earth. Let's look at Genesis 48 that was read for us earlier. And maybe you're hearing this intro and you're like, I have no idea what anything you're saying has to do with this text. So let's, let's just see if we can connect, at least my brain can connect dots. 
Um, Genesis chapter 48, it's, it's a deathbed scene. Jacob is dying. And so he's, he's giving final instructions and final words to his sons, his grandsons. In fact, it goes on to chapter 49. We'll look at chapter 49 next week. So the entirety of 48 and 49 is this extended deathbed scene um, where Jacob, who is the, the last great patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's giving final blessings and final words to his sons and as we see in our text, his grandsons. But he's doing more than just kind of saying goodbye and, and giving last words and blessing them. He, he's really, I think what's happening in this passage, and we'll see it even more clearly next week, is he's prophesying about the future. That Jacob was a prophet. God literally appeared to him. <laughs> and, and so Jacob is here telling Joseph and his brothers what will happen in the days to come. In fact, chapter 49, just a little sneak peek, next week begins this way. Jo- Jacob says, I will tell you what shall happen in the days to come. Or you could translate that, the, la- the latter days. So Jacob here is talking about the future. He's unveiling God's plans for the future to Joseph. And, and what we see, again, is the surprising way that God works out his purposes. It's not the way that the world works out its purposes. Look at chapter 48, verse 1 again. It says, After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and was told to Jacob, Your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Remember, Jacob and Israel are two names for the same guy. So so here's a deathbed scene. Um, Jacob is ill. The message comes, time to go see dad. Many of us have had this experience in our lives where we've had a loved one and we knew they were ill and then you get the call, hey, you need to get a plane ticket, you need to come. And so this is that moment, it's that moment, they're all, they're all going to start coming to see Jacob. And so Joseph shows up and Jacob sets the tone in verse 3, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan And he blessed me, and he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a company of peoples, and I will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. So again, Jacob is is framing this conversation as I'm about to, to tell you what God has told me. So again, here's Jacob. He's acting, I think, as a prophet in this passage. He's giving an oracle about the future. Uh, God appeared to Jacob. I mean, that's your basic qualification for being a prophet. How come you're a prophet? God literally spoke to me. Oh, okay. So you're a prophet. God appeared to me. So he's a prophet. And, and, and so he's saying, I'm going to tell you what God said. And what you have in verse 4, if, if you're familiar with the Abraham story, that's a reiteration of the promise given to Abraham. God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to turn you into a big, fruitful nation. I'm going to give you this land. And then out of you is going to come a blessing for all the families of the earth. So basically what Jacob is saying is, God appeared to me and told me the same thing he told my grandfather, Abraham. And and so what we're really having now is Jacob is is going to be revealing the next stages of how the God's conspiracy, (laughs) God's plan to to save a people for himself, how God is working that out. We we know what the plan is now up to Jacob. What's going to happen after that plan? Well, here's the story. So he's telling this to Jacob, to Joseph. And that's when we get the first of two surprises in this passage. Surprise number one, Jacob announces to Joseph, uh, first of all, I'm adopting your sons. Verse five. And now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Isn't that interesting? Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Sibion are mine. The children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. So, so Jacob here is, is kind of on the spot adopting these two boys as his own boys, which just seems strange to us. We don't typically do that in our culture. Um, it was something that was done in ancient cultures where they were reckoned as the descendants now of Jacob. 
So, so he's taking these boys as his own descendants. He's establishing them within the whole family architecture of who gets what inheritance and who's in charge of what. And again, this seems very strange to us. This is not common in our culture. But if you go to probably most cultures in the world throughout history, which, have, which are family-based, which are clan-based, right? It, it's a really big deal who's next to lead the tribe and who's in line in this succession and that succession. You know, when I lived in the United Arab Emirates, uh, I was really fascinated when I would hear, you know, when, when one ruler was appointed, there were lots of family conversations about who the next family ruler would be. And there were all these lineages worked out. Some of you have gotten into, you know, English history with the kings and who would be the next king after this monarch died. And so it's, it's like that. The, the family lineage thing is really important. But it's interesting. He adopts these two boys as his own. That's the first surprise. And you go, why, why did he do that? What, what was the point? And the simple answer is the Bible doesn't tell us. So there it is. If I had to guess, my best interpretation, and again, this is just me trying to figure out why this takes place in the story. My, my best interpretation is I think what's happening here is yet another elevation of Joseph over his brothers. So he's once again elevated so that his sons are now on par with his brothers, which would mean he's somewhere up here in the, the family lineage tree. So it's, it's almost like Jacob's like, you're kind of in my category your sons are going to be in your brother's category. So, so I think, you know, that's been a theme throughout this whole story is Joseph's elevation over his brothers. You know, it'd be kind of like if you had a family business, right, and, uh, and there's three siblings and dad's sold the business and, or he's going to give the business to the kids. He's like, all right, I'm going to give you a portion of the business, you a portion of the business. You, though, I'm going to give three portions of the business to your three kids. And the other two brothers and sisters would be like, what? How can you be doing that? So, so there's a, definitely a, a kind of favorite, favoritism taking place here. So anyway, he's, he's elevating them, and now, and now he's going to adopt them. So you get to verse 8, and you get to the official adoption ceremony. This is it's interesting just to see how they did this back then. Verse 8. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I've never expected to see your face. And behold, God has let me see your offspring also. So the boys were brought in, and here's Jacob sitting there. He can't see now. So he's like, who's with you, Joseph? And he's like, these are my boys. Okay, bring them close. Doesn't it kind of remind you of another scene just like this? If you, if you know the story, Jacob's father Isaac couldn't see. And Jacob actually deceived his father Isaac, pretending to be his older brother Esau, and deceived him. So there's this kind of interesting echo of that, except this time there's no deception and sin and manipulation. But anyway, so, so the boys are brought forward, and, and they're brought to, to Jacob Verse 12, then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand. So Ephraim's the younger. This is important. And Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand and he brought them near. So if I was Jacob sitting here in my bed or whatever, this would be Manasseh, the older, right here. And this would be Ephraim, the younger, right here. Okay? And then verse 14... Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger. And then with his left hand, he put it on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands from Manasseh, uh, for Manasseh was the firstborn. So, so you get this crisscross of the arms. You're like, why does he do that? Well, wait one second. Then he does the blessing. And, and here's the official adoption language. The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked. The God who's been my shepherd all my life to this day. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. Bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on. In the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. So they're going to be my boys. And let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. I love that. I love that blessing, don't you? 
I mean, this is a little bit off topic. I mean, it's really not the, the primary focus of the text, but I, I just can't pass up verse 15. Isn't that a beautiful reflection? Here's I, Jacob. He's 130 years old. And he says, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, walked. Don't you love that? That's a beautiful picture of what it means to live the Christian life. The Christian life is walking before God. There, there's an old Latin phrase that, that's used as quorum Dei, which means uh, in the presence of God or before the face of God. And it's this idea that as Christians, we live before the face of God, that he sees us at all times, and so we live our lives in a way as if God is looking at us in that moment. So he's like, we've walked before God. The God, verse 15, who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. Imagine that old shepherd who spent a century with sheep. And here he is. Just think, think all the times he's out in the wilderness with those sheep. Just reflecting on God is my shepherd. Just like I am to these sheep. It's just been drilled into him. God has been my faithful shepherd. And then verse 16 is I think a reference to the angel of the Lord. The angel who has redeemed me from all evil. I just think that's a beautiful picture of a saint who's walked with God his whole life and is now looking back and seeing the meaning of life is walking with God, that God's been my shepherd, God's redeemed me from evil. It's especially interesting when you compare what he says there about his life back to chapter 30, 47. Remember when he stood before Pharaoh last week? He stood before Pharaoh and Pharaoh's like, how old are you? And he says, I'm 130. And then he said this, Few and evil have been the days of my sojourning. <laughs> so he's looking back in his life and he's like, boy, it's gone fast. Few have been the days. Do you ever feel that the older you get? You're like, where's the time gone? It just is accelerating. You know, it's getting faster and faster. Some sort of physics relativity thing. The older you get, the faster time flies. So he's like, oh, few have been the days and evil have been the days. He's looking back in his life and he's like, man. I have had a hard life. A lot of bad things have happened in my life. And yet, he could at the same time say, but through it all, God has been my shepherd and ultimately he's redeemed me from all evil. And that's the same word. So in chapter 47, he says, my days have been evil, but then he says, God's redeemed me from all evil. And you know, the longer you're a Christian, I just think the more these words resonate. As you go through this life, and I mean, just think about it. Look back in your life. Think of all the, the tough things you've been through in life. And yet, God has been faithful, and here you are. Here you are. He's brought you, and he's still with you. I think that's an encouragement for us now. Maybe some of you right now are, are in some evil days. And, and you're like, I... I I don't know which end is up. I'm just getting pounded by life. The, 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 the days are evil. And I just want to encourage you from this to remember the shepherd is still with you. He's going to redeem you from this evil on the other end of it. In the end, for God's people, it will work out for our good and his glory. I don't know how sometimes. It baffles me. But he will redeem us from all evil. God is faithful. Anyway, that's, it's not the main point of this passage, but I just, uh, I just think it's such a sweet perspective. I mean, how often do you get to hear wisdom from a 130-year-old saint? Not that often. And here he is. But there's the other thing that happened, right? There was the crisscross thing. Joseph was not cool with that. Verse 17. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, that's the younger kid, it displeased him, and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's to Manasseh's, Head And Joseph said to his father, not, not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, put your right hand on his head. Okay, so um, what's going on here? Why is, it, who cares, like, what? Why is he so uptight about which hand and which head? Okay, so here's where it helps to understand a few things about ancient Near Eastern culture that are actually still true in the Middle East today. You can still find these cultural realities today. Here's cultural reality number one, the hands. The right hand and the left hand, which is the good hand? The right hand. That's the hand of blessing. That's the hand of authority and power. 
Uh, so, so to have someone sit at your right hand is the better honor than to sit at your left hand. Um, you know, when I was in the Middle East, you know, you just learned you shake hands with the right hand. When you're eating communally, you eat with the right hand. You do not eat oops, with the left hand or you pull your mic off. Um, you, don't, you don't do that. So, so the right hand is, is the hand. So, so to put the right hand on the right kid is a big deal because you're symbolically saying this one is the one who's in this, this, the place of honor. And it should have gone, according to the culture, to Manasseh because he was older. So this is the other cultural reality, uh, which um, you know, scholars call primogen- primogeniture, which basically means first, you know, firstborn has first place. So the first one gets the first priority. The firstborn son is the one with the honor. He's the one who is the heir apparent to lead the clan. Uh, he, he's the one with the authority. He gets a larger inheritance. There's the special honor of being the, the firstborn. And we kind of get it. You know, I mean, the, the first of anything is always super special. So, so here's the firstborn son. So what should have happened, according to the culture, according to the way society worked, is he should have put the hand of honor on the firstborn and then the second place hand on the secondborn. But instead he goes... <laughs> And Joseph's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that, Dad. Maybe, I don't know what he thought. Like, maybe Dad can't see. I mean, he's 130. Maybe he's getting a little squishy. Uh, that happens as you get older. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's just, he, he's starting to like, he's like, ah, oh, you know. But he's, Joseph, J- Joseph's trying to stop him. And Jacob knows exactly what is going on. He is sharp as a tack. Verse 19. His father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He, in other words, Manasseh the older, shall also become a people, and he shall also be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed him that day, saying, by you, Israel, pronounce blessings, saying, God, make you as, and then as he reverses the order, Ephraim and as Manasseh. He puts the second first. Thus, it says in verse 20, he put Ephraim before Manasseh. So again, why does he do that and why does it matter? What, what's the big deal? This seems surprising. Why would you mess with cultural conventions? What, what are you doing here? Again, I think Jacob is acting prophetically. He's, he's telling us how it is that God is going to accomplish his great conspiracy to save a people for himself out of the world and to bring about his kingdom into the world. And it's actually not that surprising that he did this if you've been following the entire story of Genesis. Because this is a thread that runs throughout the story of Genesis. Genesis is full of youngers overtaking and supplanting olders. Can you think of the very first one in the whole book of Genesis? Cain and Abel. Abel was born second. Cain was born first. But Abel offered the better sacrifices. He pleased God. And so God honored him. And Cain was dishonored and and rebuked by God. Um, The next one would be uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was born first to Abraham because he couldn't have children with Sarah, and so Sarah says, here, take Hagar, and so Ishmael's born, and, and then Isaac comes along. God gives him Isaac, and, and Abraham says, bless Ishmael, and he says, don't, yeah, I'm gonna take care of Ishmael, but Isaac is the one through whom my great purposes will be fulfilled. And then there was Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob and Esau. So Esau is the older, Jacob is the younger, but Jacob tricks him out of his birthright with the whole stew episode. Uh, and then, and then he, he bl- tricks him out of his blessing with the, when he deceived his father Isaac. And so the younger supplanted the older. And then the next one, Joseph and his brothers. Right? Joseph is the, the young one, and, and all the brothers are older. And then Joseph keeps having these dreams where he's like, hey, guys, I had this weird dream again where you're all going to bow down to me. And that would have been so offensive. It would just would have been so offensive at that time to those people. And yet here's the youngest saying, you're all going to bow down to me. I'm going to be in charge. 
And they're like, never, never in a thousand years, you know, we shall sell you into slavery to ensure this never happens. And, of course, that's what God uses to make it all happen. And, and so they, they bow down to him. And then, of course, there's one more. Do you remember Judah's twins? And he has twins, and the older one's arm comes out of the birth canal first, and they tie a little ribbon, and then it goes back in, and then the younger one comes out. And so it's this theme that goes throughout Genesis. What? Why is this such a big deal in Genesis? The younger supplanting the older. And what, what does it tell us about God's ways? I think, brothers and sisters, it reminds us that God's purposes in the world are being worked out through surprising characters. That it's the weak, it's the humble, it's the powerless, it's the one without prestige and status, the one who doesn't have the normal uh, cultural cachet, the one you wouldn't typically look to and say, of course, that's the one who will lead the people. And, and that theme, it just kind of echoes again and again throughout the Bible. Think about Israel itself. You know, God saved Israel out of slavery in Egypt and he brought them to the promised land. And right before he brought them to the promised land, Moses was warning them not to get all uppity about it, all right? He's like, you know, yeah, God saved you from Egypt, but don't let it go to your head, guys. He says in Deuteronomy 7, 6, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. And you can imagine Israel being like, yeah, that's right. God picked us. But then God makes them clear, verse 7. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. You were nothing. You're the la- you should have been picked last for kickball. But God picked you first. He wanted the smallest, weakest, little nation to become his people. Or when God brought them into the promised land. I, I think of the great story of the time of the judges when, uh, when Gideon was forming his army and he blew the trumpet and all the armies came and God's like, uh, 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 too many. Let's whittle it down to 300 soldiers so that everyone will know that it was God who won this victory, not the, the armies of men. Or, or even think about when you get beyond the time of the judges to the time of the, the kings who ruled the the land of Israel. First there was, who was the first king of Israel? Saul. And he fit the mold. He fit the world's mold. He was the biggest. He said it was a head taller than everyone else. He looked like a leader. You know, we want a king like the other nations. Okay, there's Saul. He looks just like the kings of the other nations. He's a big old dude and he just seems like a, a mighty warrior. And they're like, yay, we finally have the king that we want who will have the power to do what we need done in this world and to protect us. And of course, we know what happened to Saul. He, he was just a total disaster. So God picks another king, David. And you remember he sends the prophet Samuel to anoint David. Samuel doesn't know who the new king is. He just knows it's one of Jesse's sons. And he shows up at Jesse's house. And they're all a little freaked out because the prophet's there. You never know if that's going to be a good or bad thing. He's like, it's cool, it's cool. And then he's, he says, bring your sons. And remember the first son comes in, Eliab. He's the firstborn. And you remember what Samuel says? 1 Samuel 16, 6, when they came, he looked on Eliab, this is David's eldest brother, and thought, surely this, the Lord's anointed is before him. Oh, look at him. He's big. He's the guy. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God is looking for the humble man after his own heart, not for the one who just seems to have the, the, the kinds of things that we would naturally in our cultures look to for leadership and authority and power. God, God is he's drawn to David. and In fact, they go through all the sons, right? And then when it's done, Samuel's like, it's not any of these. He goes, is this all your sons? They're like, yeah. Well, there's one. We left him out in the field. <laughs> you know, he, he's the one who gets all the garbage jobs. I'm like, oh, you, want, you really want us to call him? Yeah, we're not going to eat until you bring him here. And then God says, that's the one. 
The one that all the other brothers were like, listen, you get to stick out in the fields with all the, the sheep while we can go and meet the prophet and meet the VIP for dinner and you're going to be out there, you know, watching the cars or whatever. Like just, it's, he's the king. God loves to do this. And even in the time when Jesus came, our Savior, Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all the promises to Abraham, are finally fulfilled in the offspring Christ. It's through him that all the nations would be blessed. It's through him that all of the promises to Abraham find their culmination. And Jesus comes, but he doesn't go to where the levers of power are. He doesn't go to Jerusalem and, and win over went over the high priests and the rulers. He doesn't go to Rome and, you know, and buddy up next to Caesar. I mean, where, where do you find Jesus? He's with the blind people and the lepers out in the wilderness who can't come into town. And he's, he's with the, the poor and, and the needy. He's, he's just out there. And, and that's how he's, he's working his kingdom. God's conspiracy is unfolding. The kingdom of God is happening, but it just doesn't look like the way he should do it. You know, it's so under the radar and small and weak. Why does he work this way? Why does God do this? Why is it the younger who's chosen over the older? And Paul, I think, lays it out pretty well in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In fact, if you can, just turn there, and we'll spend the rest of our time just looking at 1 Corinthians 1. Paul reflects on this in his letter, this pattern of, of the Lord using that which is small and weak, which would have been big news to the Corinthians because the Corinthians were Christians, but they had a worldly mindset. They thought that it was the most powerful orator and the most powerful philosophers who were important that, that they needed to wow Greco-Roman culture with their wisdom and their oratory. And here's Paul pointing them in a different direction. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, and I think here's God's motive, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So, you know, why does God do this? It, it's to it's to thwart the cabals with all their smarts and cleverness who are trying to engineer the world after their own image and are trying to run the world and, and they can do it without God because they're so smart and technologically savvy. And, and here's God saying, go for it. I'm gonna accomplish my purposes through what you despise. I'm gonna take what you think is foolish, weak, lame and pointless and that's where I will save and bring about my kingdom in this world so as to overturn the wisdom of the world. I mean, it happens in the message that we preach. We preach the gospel. Think about how foolish the gospel is. Verse 22, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, folly to Gentiles, not very successful to Americans. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, so God loves this method. <laughs> he says, I'm going to, okay, this is how we're going to save people. We're going we're gonna to do it through a message. And here's the message. Here's the main bullet points. Christ crucified. Like, what? That's the message? That's what's going to save the world and bring about God's kingdom? Is, is a, you know, no, God. You know, we need, we need, okay, Christ, okay, fine. We can maybe have a cross. I mean, that's kind of hip. But we need something else, God. Like, we need, we need some really good marketing. And we need um, a great social media campaign if we're going to reach the world, 
And we need to identify the seven hills of power and culture. And we're going to take control of each of those hills of power. There's none of that in the Bible. There's only one hill in the Bible that matters. It's the hill of Calvary. God's like, you want, you want to bring my kingdom? Point people to that ridiculous cross. That's how I'm going to accomplish my purposes in the world. And, and I think, you know, we just have a, a predilection for that which is big and grand and clever and, and well-organized and schemed, big ministries, big strategies. But God loves that which is weak and foolish. He uses a foolish message, a foolish message of a crucified Savior that, that just kind of weeds people out. <laughs> You know, you're either like, wow, that's interesting, tell me more, or you're like, that's ridiculous, I'm out of here. The gospel does this. It, it sorts and sifts. Or even, don't even just think about the gospel. Think about the people who are saved by the gospel. Verse 26. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise, according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. You know, the the church throughout its history has mostly been nobodies, with some exceptions, you know? And again, that's not the way we tend to think. We tend to think, listen, if we're going to make an impact on this culture, we, we need to win to Christ some people who've got pull. You know? we, we need to get some senators who are Christians, uh, and then we need to add to them you know, some uh, professional football players. Uh, and, um, and we need some A-list Hollywood actors and some, you know, some singers, and, and you know, people that the world respects. And if we can get those people saved, then everyone will just jump on board Christianity. And, you know, that we're like, that's what we need. Now, don't get me wrong. I praise God for every single person who's really saved. I mean, if a senator gets saved or an A-list actor gets saved, you know, the angels in heaven throw a party. We rejoice at every salvation. What I'm saying is, beware the mentality that the way that we're going to bring God's purposes forward is, is you know, if, if we can orchestrate a, you know, a wave election, then we'll bring God's kingdom. That's not the way it works. That's not how God works. God is working through nobodies. Not many of you were anything, Paul says. Yeah, a few of you... And most of you are nobodies. That's how it is throughout the world. God is, is saving a people for himself that nobody has heard of and who have no status and can't go in and, and tweet something and have a, two million people be like, wow, that's amazing. Like, you know, you and I could tweet things and no one would care. No one cares. Does anyone really care anyway about any of that? You know, so, so, so anyway, you know, this is how God works. It's amazing. Why does he work this way? Verse 29. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So that he gets the glory and we get the joy. God will not share his glory with another, nor should he. And because of him, Paul says, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so the church is a place full of people who boast in the Lord, who are nobodies. And even if you're somebody, you don't take yourself very seriously. (laughs) That's what I find with Christians. Even Christian somebodies who are really devout Christians, they're like, seriously, that doesn't matter. What matters is Christ. What matters is the gospel. Even the somebodies in Christ are boasting in the Lord because we realize it's all him. And so brothers and sisters, I I just want to encourage you that, you know, when you get discouraged and, and you see things happening in the world and we feel so powerless, God is at work. 
But his kingdom is coming in such a surprising, under the radar, muted kind of way most of the times. I mean, there are periods, there are events, there are revivals. God does big things at times. But I'm telling you, the meat and potatoes of the kingdom of God is is just so humble most of the time. I mean, most of God's work is in small little churches with nobody pastors who are never going to write a book or start a podcast or be the father of a movement. They're just faithful pastors that you'll never hear of till glory who are just faithfully ministering and making disciples. You know, that, that's, those are the kind of churches that God is working in globally around the world. You know, that's, that's what I hope to produce here, you know, with Teddy and other pastoral apprentices. I, I, I'm not looking to produce any world changers. I just want faithful shepherds who I know are going to be like 30 years from now still pastoring Jesus without blowing up or, or diverting from the gospel. I, I trust in the long-term fruit of that more than some kind of, you know, big flash-in-the-pan celebrity pastor. Give me those faithful shepherds that, that nobody knows. I, I love Count Zinzendorf. I don't know if you knew, uh, heard of him from the um, uh, 18th century. Uh, he was the founder of the Moravian Mission Movement. They sent, the Moravians are amazing. They sent missionaries all throughout the world, even before the modern mission movement, where the, kind of the Moravians doing their thing. And, uh, and, and Zinzendorf, you know, his, his motto was, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. <laughs> I love that. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. That's all God wants. He's using small, faithful pastors. God's kingdom is coming through very ordinary church members who are not founding large movements or changing the world, but are faithfully praying for their neighbors, faithfully talking to their neighbors and co-workers and fellow kids at school, inviting them to, to... Talk about the Lord, sharing that Christ crucified message with them as God gives opportunity, loving people. God's kingdom is coming through people at the end of a church service, just sharing with each other and praying for each other. Very humble, simple stuff. God's kingdom is coming when parents and grandparents just sit with their kids and grandkids and read a Bible story. That's where God's doing his work. Where, where parents say, you know what, you're not going to be a, you're not going to go to the World Cup, so you're not going to play soccer on Sunday. Our family goes to church. We worship Jesus. This is what is more important, you know, <laughs> rather than following the cultural patterns of like, my kid's got to be a superstar at everything. Like, no, he doesn't. Like, he's not going to be. <laughs> you know, th- your kids need to know that God comes before all else. And your life and your patterns will teach them one lesson or another. So, isn't it great to hear a kid's voice in the sanctuary? (laughs) Praise God for that. That's how the kingdom is coming. Faithful grandparents, faithful parents, faithful volunteers in a kid's ministry who just want to minister to kids and, and love kids. God's kingdom is coming in living rooms, in community groups where people sit together and talk about the word and love each other and pray for each other and and invite people into their homes for meals. God's kingdom is coming through ordinary missionaries who just faithfully labor away to plant healthy churches in hard places and give of their lives. God's kingdom is coming in places where Christians are in prisons, where they are not succeeding from a worldly standpoint, where they are incarcerated or suffering, and yet this is where God is working. He loves to work through the powerless and the weak in the eyes of the world. And so, brothers and sisters, let us not lose heart when we feel like the whole world's conspiring against us. Don't worry about it. God is going to win. He's going to win in a way that's going to totally embarrass the world on the last day. Where the whole world's going to be like, we lost to that? <laughs> God's going to be like, yep, this is who you lost to. This bunch of yahoos. How did you do it? You know, Because I'm God. And contrary to everything you thought, you're not. 
you don't rule anything. God will say, I rule everything. And only now at the end, unfortunately, do you understand that there is one God and only one God. And we are just creatures made of dust upheld by his power. And so brothers and sisters, fear not. The younger shall rule the older. The meek shall inherit the earth. The poor shall possess the kingdom of God. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure, Jesus said, to give you the kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory tonight for every good thing in our lives, our salvation, all of the the good that you've done, Lord. And we, we just give you the glory and credit Lord, you, it's all from you. Every good gift comes from above, from the Father of lights. And so, Lord, we just praise you for all that. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you have been our shepherd all the days of our lives until now. We thank you that you've been our redeeming angel who's redeemed us from all evil. We thank you, Lord, that we've been able to walk before you and sojourn before you. We just thank you for how faithful you are. And God, we thank you that you are accomplishing your purposes despite politics and despite uh, conspiracies and despite whatever uh, the, the, the great minds of our age may be doing or not doing, Lord, it ultimately doesn't matter because it's futile. And you, you will win the day through the, what the world considers foolish. And so, Lord, thank you for saving foolish people like us. And thank you, Lord, that anyone can come to you, even now, and simply say, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. In fact, Lord, that's the only way to come to you is in weakness and in need not in boasting and not in self-salvation. And so, Lord, we just pray, give us grace to come humbly in the fear of God and to trust that through simple faithfulness you can do great things, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we come to the Lord's Supper, uh, we want to celebrate communion. Uh, Hopefully you picked up one of these cups when you came in. There's a bread in one cup and juice in another. If you didn't, you can um, just slip to the back real quick. This communion table, I mean, what a reminder that, that God has given us of Jesus' death on the cross for us. This bread that we eat symbolizes the body of Jesus given for us. This cup we drink symbolizes the blood of Jesus that was poured out for us. What simple things. Isn't it amazing that one of the means of grace God's given us is just to eat a piece of bread and drink some, some grape juice, right? Isn't that, that's just so fitting, <laughs> God's like, this is how you're going to remember me, bread and juice. It's humble. It's simple. And yet this is how Christ is with us. His presence is is with us through the Holy Spirit by faith. And he nourishes us spiritually as we take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, This Lord's Supper is open to anyone here today who has trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you've not trusted in Christ, uh, we, we ask you not to take these elements. Because by taking these, what you're saying is that you're sharing, you're putting your faith in Christ and that you've trusted in him alone for your salvation. Let's just take a moment to pray and invite you to just come before the Lord and thank him for what he's given us on the cross and confess sin that needs to be confessed and to examine ourselves and to make sure we are honoring Christ with our hearts and our lives before we honor him with this ceremony. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your blood shed on the cross. We know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Jesus, that through your death and resurrection, we have been made righteous in your sight. Thank you, Jesus, that your righteousness has been imputed to us and our sin and our guilt has been imputed to you so that you view us as righteous and holy in your sight. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Help us to walk more faithfully with you. Help us to trust your word. Help us not to be deceived by the siren songs of the world, but to believe what your word says about right and wrong and truth and error. Lord, we want to be faithful servants. We want to make it across the finish line. Lord Jesus, be with us, we pray. Amen. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread. This is Matthew chapter 25. And after 
He broke it. He gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Let's eat together. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's drink together. Church, let's stand together. Um, one of the things that communion does, it points us to the, the feast that we will have together with Christ. And so it looks back, right? But it also looks forward. Uh, and this song that we're about to sing, we will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Let's sing. We will feast. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great. We will. 
It's by City Alight. I commend all of their music to you. Good music, City Alight. A um, few announcements before you go. Uh, have five. Number one, if you're a newcomer to the church, uh, or if you'd like to get involved in one of our community groups, there's a newcomer's table uh, in the back on your way out. It'll be on your left-hand side. Don't let the fact that it's on the left and not the right discourage you. <laughs> it's on the left, but it's still good. It's still good. Um, what's that? It's on, the right it's on the right coming in. I thank you. <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. Yes. Um, uh, food truck outside if you'd like to uh, have dinner here. We'd love to have you hang around for that. Thursday night at 5, we have um, a retired insurance lawyer here doing a seminar on how to deal with insurance companies. So if you find that helpful, if you know of other people who would find that helpful, we would love to uh, serve you in that way. She's uh, a member of a church down in Naples and a good Christian lady. Um, Christmas Eve, 5 p.m. here. We'll come here, and then for the candlelight portion, we'll all go outside in the field and do candles out there, which will be pretty cool, Lord willing and weather permitting. And then uh, the next day, which is Sunday, Christmas Day, we'll have church here at 10. So we worship the Lord on Sunday, and it's great to be together on that day. Uh, feel free to bring your kids in their PJs. That'll be fun. Um, and lastly, prayer. Uh, if, you like, if you're just like, man, I just need someone to pray with me. I, I just got to get some stuff off my chest. I'm available. The other pastors are available. Just find one of us. Uh, Jay and uh, Lori Richter are here. And actually, if I just have you guys stand up in the front, they'll be here to pray with you if you'd like prayer after the service. They'll be like over there by those trees. And then, um, and then finally, if you guys who just close the service like we've been doing, is just form a small circle around you. Can I just have one courageous person in your circle? Thank God again for Jesus' sacrifice for us and all that he's done for us. It's fitting to do that. So find, make an impromptu circle around you. All you need is one brave person to thank God for what Jesus has done on the cross.